So uh, some of you might need a little bit of a review of what an isotope is. So I thought I might uh, do that right now just quickly, uh, focusing on the important isotope for right now, which is oxygen. Um, so you guys might remember the standard Bohr model of, a, um, uh, uh, of an element where you have the nucleus and you have uh, electrons spinning around on the outside, right, in the, in the different shells, right? And uh, we are not worried in this case uh, with, uh, about the electrons um, in this case. We're worried about what's going on in the nucleus of this atom, okay? So in an oxygen, um, uh, or an oxygen uh, atom, what we have in that nucleus, right, are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight positively charged, remember these, protons, eight protons in oxygen, okay? And we also have in there one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight neutrally charged, neutrons, right? And we say that the number of protons is the atomic number, right, which is eight, and that is what defines the, um, the element oxygen, right? The number of neutrons plus the number of protons, if you add those up, uh, you get 16, right? And that gives us the atomic mass number, okay? Or the atomic weight, okay? It's usually not, um, the, essentially the electrons weigh essentially nothing. Um, and so, but this number can actually be on the periodic chart, some decimal, and you're gonna see why that is in a little bit, okay? Um, so that would be in the standard oxygen atom, eight plus eight, right? But there is a, another isotope of oxygen. So this is, this, this is the most common isotope. This is O16, right, because of the mass number. But now we can have oxygen that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight protons, just like our friend over here, right? So we have eight protons. And it will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten neutrons. It's heavy, right? It's got two extra neutrons. Its atomic mass is now 18, right? So this isotope, this is the O16 isotope of, of oxygen. Again, what's important to know is that these isotopes of oxygen are stable. They don't decay. They're not like uranium or thorium or some potassium isotopes and things of that sort that have unstable nuclei. These nuclei are stable. The amount doesn't change um, and has probably been the same amount in, our, in the Earth system since the Earth formed, okay? So um, oxygen, the, the rate, and this is like way less than 1% of all the oxygen, but it's a fairly stable number. Um, and so we can use the ratio of these two uh, to tell you something about climate. Hi, I want to talk to you today about how we use what are called stable isotopes of oxygen to understand climate change and how the Earth's climate has naturally changed um, over the last, really, 65 million years. Um, but we have even better data for younger, um, uh, for less time. So uh, the first thing that you have to understand um, is that oxygen that we breathe and that is in water and that is in ice um, has, is mainly comprised of the isotope that we think of as O16, right? That element, um, the oxygen 16 with eight protons and eight neutrons 
in the uh, nucleus. But a small percentage of all oxygen that is available to us is another heavier isotope called O18. It has two extra neutrons in its nucleus. So a relatively small percentage of oxygen that we consume and that is in the atmosphere and is in the system is this heavier isotope. Uh, and what we do as scientists is we look at the ratio of these um, that we call uh, del O18, and we can go into more detail on that uh, uh, later. But this is the ratio of O18 to O16, okay? So you have to think about uh, this ratio. We're not going to just talk about the absolute amounts of O18 and O16. We're going to think about the ratio of them. All right, so now let's just think about a natural Earth system. We have a big ice sheet, Antarctica, uh, Greenland, right? And we have the Earth world's oceans sitting out here. And they obviously have a lot of oxygen in them, right? So if we look at the oceans um, and we evaporate the oceans, right? And we create water vapor. So we have evaporation. Right? We are going to take up, because it's lighter, we're going to take more O18 up than O16. Right? So we're going to have lots of O16 and relatively little O18 because of evaporation. Right? Um, so evaporation is going to tend to what we call fractionate O16. It's going to take it up preferentially into the atmosphere. Right? And of course, this oxygen is going to get tied up in water vapor. And the water vapor is going to move from the equator toward the poles where there's rainfall uh, and there's snow, right? And so the snow that eventually snows and makes ice over here in the glaciers, right, is coming from this enriched, or I'm sorry, this, uh, this water vapor that has a lot of O16 in it, right? So we have snow over here that comes from that water vapor. With me? Okay, so now let's think about a situation um, where the Earth um, is, is essentially uh, getting colder, okay? So what happens when the Earth gets colder? The ice sheet gets bigger, right? This grows, right? It grows out and it grows up, and there's more and more and more water tied up in ice, right? So what this means is we are taking O16 out of the system and putting it into the ice, right? So the O16 that was in the oceans is now coming out of the oceans and going into the ice. So if we think about this ratio, right, when it's getting colder, there is more... O16 in the ice. So in the ice, that ratio, the O, O18 to O16 ratio, right, because there's more O16 in it, goes down. Right? Because there's more O16 going in here. Think about the oceans, on the other hand. Right? When it's getting colder, the oceans... Are, the ice is, is growing, tying up all that O16, and the oceans are losing O16, right? So when it gets colder in the oceans, then there is less O16, right? Which means uh, that there is less in the oceans, which means this ratio O18 to O16, right, because there's less of it, um, goes up in the seawater, right? So what's happening here is when the ice is growing, we're taking O16 out of the oceans and putting it into the ice, and it's changing the ratio. So if I can measure the O18 to O16 ratio here somehow, and if I can measure that ratio here through time, I'm measuring when the ice sheets are getting bigger, when the climate is colder. And then when things melt, the opposite happens. We release more O16 back into the oceans, and that ratio goes down in the oceans, and it goes up in the ice sheets. 
So it's actually a very useful indicator of when ice sheets are growing and shrinking. And then that's allowing us to tell when climate is getting colder or warmer. All right, so now how do we use those isotope ratios to tell something about climate change back through time, okay? So recall, right, that we're changing that isotopic ratio in the oceans and in the ice, right? Well, we need some way to sample back through time that value, right? And the way we do that in the oceans, so make sure you're clear on this, in the oceans, we bring ships out into the ocean, we take cores of the sediment, um, and as we go down and we take these cores, we can actually get ages um, of, the, of the layers in the core. Um, and so we actually know that the oldest stuff is at the bottom, the youngest stuff is at the top, and uh, we can actually calibrate the age with things like radiocarbon dating and other techniques. So we, can ha we have a way of precisely knowing the age of the sediment. Now where do we get the isotopic information? Well, it turns out that in these cores are little critters, I'm gonna draw one here, like they don't even look like that, maybe they look more like this, that are called foraminifera, okay? Or forams for short. And guess what? Their shells are made of calcium carbonate. Right, same thing that makes up limestone. Oh my, look what's in there, oxygen. Right? So it turns out that these forams, when they were living up here, like so here's a little foram and here's a foram floating around, they are building their shells out of this ocean water. Right? They're making their shells out of this ocean water and they are sampling the isotopic ratio of the water that they formed in. So if we can go through this core and pull out forams, going up through the core, and we know their ages, we can put these little forams in what's called a mass spectrometer, and we can measure the ratio of O18 to O16 in each of those little samples going up through the core. And what we wind up with is a plot of that O18 value going up through the core, and it will be some kind of jig-jaggedy line like this, right? So we will get a, uh, from going by depth and the oxygen isotope ratio, we can tell when that, how that oxygen isotope ratio is varying, right? So if you remember from the last video, we said that when, if this is a high value and this is a low value, right? When this value is low, there's a lot of oxygen 16 in the oceans. That means things are melting, right? That means we're putting oxygen-16 back into the oceans. So this number is going up relative to this. So this number is getting smaller because it's in the denominator. So when this value is low, things are melting, that's warm, right? And when that number is high, we're taking O16 out and putting it into the ice. Things are getting colder, right? That's cold, right? So that's in the marine system. That's how we get what's called an oxygen isotope record from a marine core, all right? So now you see how we understand um, the climate change, warm versus cold, um, using marine data, okay? Um, but we also have another, what we call, archive, or climate archive, and those are ice cores. Um, ice cores uh, are really effective for giving us um, sort of the more recent, like say last two million years of, um, of, of uh, climate change data, because ice accumulates as layers, and those layers have bubbles in them, and those bubbles are representative of the atmosphere at the time the, um, the ice was forming, right? So we can actually sample the atmospheric chemistry 
from the bubbles in these ice cores. So we can do the same thing that we did here. We can either count the layers, which is they tend to be annual. We can also find carbon in these that we can date, so we know the age of the ice core, right, going down through the core. And we can create a similar kind of curve for the ice uh, where we get, um, where we have a wiggly curve, just like we did with the, um, the, the marine sediment core, right? And we have low values and we have high values of that isotopic ratio O18 to O16, right? But now remember in the ice, what we're doing, right? We're taking, o when things are growing, we're taking O16 and putting it in here. That means when this ratio um, is getting, when this O16 is getting bigger, this is getting lower, right? Um, so we're taking it out of the oceans and putting it into the ice. That means this is cold, right? And when it's higher, we're taking that O16, putting it into the oceans. This number is going up, so now this is warm, right? So you'll notice that in the ice, low values are cold. In the marine setting, warm, value, uh, warm values are low, right? And here, high values are warm, and here, high values are cold. They're behaving oppositely, right? Um, and what it means is that ice cores can give us very precise records of um, changes in isotopes, which are telling us advance and retreat of the ice sheets. 